Buonasera ragazzi, buonasera a tutti, come va? Bentornati per i nostri martedì intervistosi. <ride> allora, io so, io so troppo basso, tu sei troppo alta, perché questa cosa? Per questa sedia? Eh, la se ah, la eh. sedia è troppo alta, troppo in alto sulla mm. sedia. Comunque ragazzi, buonasera, buonasera a tutti, bentornati, sono felice di essere di nuovo qui per una nuova intervista con la partnership la sponsorizzazione della mia Kelly, della nostra Kelly ormai. E allora, stasera faremo quattro chiacchiere con Rick Porras. Lo sapete, è presente nel titolo dell'evento, dell avete visto anche la locandina. Spero che abbiate fatto i compiti e quindi abbiate letto qualcosa, anche perché adesso comunque l'andremo a leggere insieme. Quindi, come vi dissi la volta scorsa... Che cosa abbiamo fatto? Che cosa stiamo facendo? Stiamo andando ad ascoltare tutti quelli che sono i vari punti di vista che hanno lavorato intorno al progetto di Peter Jackson, quindi alla trilogia del Signore degli Anelli. Quindi, per riassumere, fino adesso che cosa abbiamo fatto? Abbiamo ascoltato la, il punto di vista di un orco, poi quello eh, di, eh, di un hobbit, di una hobbit. Abbiamo ascoltato per ora solo io e Kelly... Poi avrete anche voi la live registrata a quello di un elfo. E adesso, stasera, andremo ad ascoltare il punto di vista, invece, di un tecnico, possiamo definirlo, di un coproduttore della trilogia del Signore degli Anelli, tutti e tre i film, e di un regista di unità aggiunte. E sarà stesso il nostro Rick a spiegarvi che cosa vuol dire. Ha diretto alcuni degli attori all'interno della trilogia. Comunque, ripeto, sarà lui a spiegarvi qual è stato il suo ruolo all'interno della trilogia. Quindi stasera andremo un po' più nel tecnico. E, prima però vi vengo a salutare. Dopodiché leggiamo la bio e introduciamo Rick. Saluto a tutti ragazzi, buonasera a tutti, buonasera Frank, Ellie e Chat, prontissimi per la serata. Grande Samuele, grande, grande, grande. Buonasera Black Juan, buonasera Giuseppe, Francesco, ciao a tutti ragazzi, ciao a tutti, mi fa piacere che siamo, siete tutti qui. Belli pronti, lo spero, e bando alle ciance, leggiamo subito la bio, sì. la bio di Rick Porras, quindi io la condivido, e vogliamo fare una cosa, vogliamo, farla, vogliamo leggerla insieme a Rick. Do you want to be, read that with Rick? Let's, let's do an intro first. Ok, e infatti non, an... mi sembra brutto che lasciarlo in stand-by. Ok, giustamente, allora, noi abbiamo già a disposizione il nostro Rick. Quindi facciamo una bella cosa, l'avrei voluto introdurre dopo, però a questo punto ve lo introduciamo subito. Vi presento, ho l'onore e il piacere di presentarvi qui con noi il coproduttore e director unit, o unit director, della trilogia del Signore degli Anelli, Rick Porras. Buonasera Rick. Hi, hello, Rick. hello. Hi, nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you Rick, thank you, thank you. And uh, welcome, welcome to Valinor. <laughs> yeah, so you're joining us from beautiful, sunny California, correct? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm in Venice Beach. It's a, it's a little chilly for us Californians, you know. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little cold, but it's blue skies and, uh, it, you know, uh, but I, look, I, I love Italy and uh, I wish I could be over there right now. Ah, ok, quindi lui... Sì, sì, abita in California, a Venice, Venezia, la uh -huh. Venezia californiana. La uh -huh. e in realtà lì fa freddo, da quello che ci ha detto, però il cielo è blu e ama l'Italia. Puoi chiedergli se è mai stato in Italia? Have you been in Italy before? Sì. I'm sure you have. Uh, yeah, I, I actually am half Italian. Um, my mother is, my mother's family is uh, from, from the north, um, just outside of Milan and also from uh, Piedmontese. Um, so I visited, mm -hmm. you know, where my family's from and then uh, I had my honeymoon there and um, where? yeah. I, where I, did I you have been... your honeymoon? Yeah. Ha avuto la sua luna di miele in Italia, ragazzi. Yeah, we had our honeymoon in Rome and, and nice. uh, Capri. Um, but I oh, have, uh, I have <laughs> Roma been... e Capri. Yeah, I can't. You can't beat that. But I have I have been to Naples, um, where you guys are, and a bit of the Amalfi Coast. But there's so much of Italy I haven't seen, so I have to keep going back. Ok, allora, ha visto tanto dell'Italia, tra cui anche Napoli, e spera di poter tornare molto presto. E ovviamente l'invito. 
I told him, I said, he's he's got to come. He's got a place to stay. We can take him all around. We can do Pompeii. We can do Positano. We can... Go Abbiamo on. promesso di portarlo un po' ovunque, ragazzi. Yeah. Quindi mi raccomando, anche voi fate le prenotazioni. E allora, ovviamente, io ringrazio ancora Rick, gli do il benvenuto e leggiamo insieme la sua bio direttamente dalla pagina di Wikipedia. Yeah. La voglio prendere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Rick, um, what we're, we're saying is we're going to, we wanted to introduce uh, you to the community together. So, we're going to read a little bit of your bio uh, that we've pulled up here, uh, just, just very briefly. Innanzitutto, co- co- già il fatto che ci sia una pagina di Wikipedia su uh-huh. Corras. Cioè. In Italian, though, Rick. In, in Italia, in Italia, yeah, in Italia. Leggiamola legge- velocemente in italiano. Dai. Rick Porras è un produttore americano, in particolare co-produttore della trilogia del il film, il signo della trilogia del Signore degli Anelli. È cresciuto nella uh, Baia, l'area di San Francisco. Uh-huh e ha frequentato la Stanford University, yep. laureandosi nel 1988 in storia. Quindi è, è come me, appassionato, oh, appassionato di storia, laureato in storia. Ha avuto un'apparizione cameo con Peter Jackson e altri membri delle, del, dell'equip nell'edizione speciale estesa del ritorno del re nei panni di un corsaro pirata. Dovete sapere infatti che oltre ad essere il coproduttore e uno dei, eh, dei registi delle varie unità degli attori durante la trilogia, è, stato, è comparso anche con un cameo come Corsaro di Umbar. Ed esattamente nella versione estesa del, eh, del terzo capitolo, cioè del ritorno del re. Andiamo più in basso e leggiamo quelli che sono stati i suoi, i suoi lavori. Come produttore ha collaborato a, to- a Contact, tra l'altro è un film molto, molto, molto interessante, io lo consiglio questo film, del 97, poi la trilogia, tutti e tre i capitoli della trilogia del Signore degli Anelli e Cartel L, El Cartel, uh-huh. come sempre come produttore esecutivo. Questo film mi manca, lo devo, lo devo recuperare. Uh-huh. Poi, come equi- in, vari, in vari ruoli ha, pub- ha partecipato La morte diventa lei, tradotto in italiano, The Public Eye, di Zemeckis, come assistente di, <ride> di Robert Zemeckis, uh-huh. Forrest Gump, e Big Dreams Little Tokyo, anche questo è un film che conosco, direttore di produzione per esempio, Forrest Gump, e questo qui è, invece, se non sbaglio, il nome italiano non me lo ricordo esattamente, Perduti nel tempo o una cosa del genere, se non sbaglio, è un horror che, nel, questo è il titolo inglese, The Frighteners. E, come vi dicevo prima, tra, come direttore di seconda unità, e sarà stesso lì che a spiegarvi cosa vuol dire, sempre della trilogia del Signore degli Anelli, e infine, come attore, non solo come controfigura di Gollum, ma anche nel film King Kong, il film di King Kong che è sempre di eh, Peter Jackson. Quindi ha lavorato con tantissimi registi, tra cui Zemeckis e Peter Jackson. Incredible. Yeah. Quindi, ragazzi, so... stasera potremo andare anche in domande un po' più tecniche, se c'è qualcuno di voi che è interessato a quell'aspetto. So I'll translate a little bit for Rick. Rick, we yeah. just ran through your filmography a little bit. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about your career working with different directors and, and different roles that you've had. We even touched a little bit on, you say you're not an actor, but um, you've, had, you've had a few acting roles. No, um, just cameos. <laughs> just don't count. They're super cool for me anyways. Super, super exciting to see, and especially in some of the, the extras um, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So... Um, With that, do you want to dive right in? Rick, you ready? We'll dive right into some questions. Sure, sounds good. Okay, awesome. Um, so as we just mentioned, you've worked on a number of major films in addition to The Lord of the Rings with our um, beloved Peter Jackson, obviously. And we've, yeah. got the, um, we've got the questions you'll see them pop up in, in Italian below, uh, below there. So they're already translated. Um, but you've worked on one of my favorites, Death Becomes Her, so cool, oh, Forrest yeah. Gump. Um, contact, lots of um, sci-fi, fantasy types of films. Would you say you're particularly drawn to that genre? No, I mean, look, I, I mean, I love sci-fi and I love fantasy, but it's, it was more just drawn to the filmmakers. I was lucky enough to work for Zemeckis and that led me to getting to work um, for Peter. And it, it just, um, yeah, I, I think it's more, uh, I approached when I, when I showed up in LA looking for work and kind of working my way through, I kind of approached it like trying to work with certain types of filmmakers and trying to work on certain types of films. Um, but in general, in terms of genre, yeah, sure. I, I love those two genres. So that was just um, a bit of luck. 
Ok, quindi dice sì. che si adora la genre, ma... Che è andato al, in California iniziando come videomaker, dopodiché si sì, è iniziato a lavorare anche con Peter Jackson e i suoi generi preferiti sono essenzialmente quelli, quindi la fantascienza, il fantasy, e molto simile a me, fra l'altro. Sì, sì. Ha i miei stessi gusti. Uh, Rick, you have the, 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 the same my preference, is fantastic, sci-fi, fantasy. Yeah, yeah. You are similar. Yeah. Ok. Next one. Yeah. Ah. Uh, prego. So you worked with Peter Jackson before mm -hmm. the Lord of the Rings on The Frighteners. Um, yeah. And I believe one of our previous interviewers had as well. Was it, I think it was Sarah McLeod, wasn't it? Did Sarah work on The Frighteners? Mm -hmm. I think she yeah. may have. Yeah, I think she did. I mean, I, yeah. So I, I was brought in um, in post-production. So I didn't actually work uh, with any of the actors except for, a bit with Michael J. Fox when we did ADR uh, for his his work. Um, so, uh, yeah. So ba basically, for me, um, what happened was Zemeckis was uh, working uh, with Peter on it. He was executive producing it, and um, there came a moment when the studio, conscious of the fact that Peter um, and Fran and his and their team were in New Zealand that they wanted to get a 20 minute reel um, of, of, you know, sort of big moments in the movie so they could get a feel for how the movie was shaping up. Mm. Do you want to translate or should I keep going? So is that, and just to be clear, it real like that, is that kind of the preface to what a trailer might be? No, no, this, this is not, it's okay. not, it's, it's tip. It, it doesn't, I, it, it's not like it's something that happens often it's just you know hey he wants to see something let's put some scenes together and give them a feel for what we're doing for what's coming so, out um, so okay. the, the, the thing is when you do that um there, there's only two outcomes either they love it and you never know what comes from that or <laughs> they don't love it and all of a sudden they're you know on top of you and and really uh you know really uh you know making things maybe difficult or, or not, but I mean, they're, they're part of the process, you know, so you're hoping that they love the real. And in this case they did, they thought it was fantastic. And it was Peter and Fran, you know, put together just a, an amazing reel of that, you know, that kind of showed what they were doing in the film. And um, the studio decided, this is great. Let's actually get this movie out in theaters earlier. So instead of the movie being released, you know, for, for Halloween, you know, that kind of time of year to take advantage of the horror aspects to the movie, they instead decided to release it at the beginning of summer. And so all of a sudden, Peter went from having a, a normal post that he was used to to having a truncated post, a much shorter post. And so that's when I became involved with the project. Was that a good decision in your opinion? Um, I... I think the natural place would have been for the Halloween period. You know, um, I, I think that uh, that would have, I would have preferred it if they had, if the studio just, you know, kept their current schedule, but I was probably one of the benefactors of it, which, cause it meant that I sure. got to go down to New Zealand and work with Peter and Fran and get to know them. And, and, um, and just, you know, it, it was a wonderful experience for me. And so I, I got to get, you know, because of that, that's what eventually led to me getting to work on Lord of the Rings. So if it wasn't for that decision, they might not have needed the extra, you know, extra folks down there to help get it done. Ottimo. So, quindi... Ah, per ahead. tradurre molto, molto in maniera sintetica, prima di lavorare con, sulla trilogia del Signore Anelli, Rick ha lavorato con Peter Jackson anche su questo film che è Sospesi nel Tempo, che è il film di cui, a cui vi ho accennato prima, The Frighteners, credo che questo sia il titolo in inglese e eh, il film piacque così tanto ai, alla produzione che cercarono di farlo uscire prima nel periodo di Halloween e questa cosa eh, diciamo è stata per lui un'esperienza molto interessante molto istruttiva e che fra l'altro ha creato il legame poi con Peter Jackson per andare poi a lavorare sulla trilogia ovviamente ragazzi io vi darò i concetti chiave di quello che dirà Rick e poi chi ovviamente vorrà potrà riguardarsi la live e ascoltarla anche meglio. Comunque, 
Rick si, si, si capisce molto tranquillamente, il suo inglese eh, riesco, è perfetto, riesco, a, <ride> riesco a capirlo per sicuro. He's from California, you're going to be able to understand. Ha un accento... So, he cannot stand my accent, and this is not my accent. I'm from I can understand you, Rick, but I can't understand my wife, so <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> I was surprised because I, as a Californian, I slur everything together, so... It's <laughs> more relaxed, but, but yeah. it's, I would say it's a little more traditional, you know, kind of standard English, whereas me, yeah. when I get angry, it's like the country really starts <laughs> coming out, and he just, he can't understand anything, so... Next one. Yeah. Can I can I just throw one one other thing? Yes, please do. Yeah. So when I um what the two the two things happened. One was that they decided to release earlier, so mm -hmm. they needed extra help um in terms of just organizing of things down there. But the second thing was that basically there were two two possible jobs on offer, and one was to work at Weta Digital, and the other one was to work as the post supervisor on it. And um there was another gentleman that was working already working on the project and he was really interested in continuing on, but, but basically producing the visual effects from what a digital side, he, he preferred to, to do that. And that was actually okay with me because it meant that I got to work in my opinion, more closely with the filmmakers, you know, that I got to work with Peter mm -hmm. and Fran and get to know them. Um, I sure I would have gotten to know them in the other job, but working in post in the same office, you know um, it just, it just was something that I preferred uh, to be more part of that process than, than only dealing on the visual effects. And was that your first experience like that where you were sì, working closely? Spiego molto, molto, molto semplicemente. Lui aveva varie opportunità di lavorare su questo film, tra cui anche quello del supervisore del, degli effetti digitali. E lui scelse proprio quel lavoro, quel ruolo, perché era molto più vicino alla sua passione come videomaker, ovviamente. And was that your first experience like that in post-production and working so closely with the actual filmmakers? No, no, I, that's what, because I'm on Forrest Gump, I had been a post-supervisor as well as okay. some other stuff. So I, but it was more just that, um, that as much as I love visual effects and every, you know, each of those big movies that I worked on were all heavily in visual effects. So I was very much involved in that part from the filmmaking side. I, I preferred to be still, you know, by the cutting rooms in the filmmaking side rather than over at the visual effects facility, which is a separate, you know, structure and a separate entity. Mm -hmm. So for me, I wanted to stay on, on, on the film side, on the filmmaking team side, if that makes sense. È un, è un vero e proprio videomaker, lui adora quel tipo di ruolo e ha preferito rimanere nella sala dove si fanno appunto i, i tagli, dove si lavora in post-produzione, tra cui appunto anche gli effetti visivi. Quindi è un tecnico, ragazzi, e infatti sarà molto interessante scoprire il lato più tecnico del suo lavoro sulla trilogia. Andiamo avanti, prego, next one. So... Um... Oh. <laughs> you returned to work with Peter Jackson on all three mm -hmm. films of the Lord of the, the Rings trilogy, but you had a number of different roles, co-producer, um, an additional unit director. Can you tell us a little bit about what's involved in each of those roles? Yeah, I mean, for starters, I was not alone in that. You know, there are a lot of people that did multiple roles. Um, there were a lot of units in the end. Um, you know, there's obviously the main unit that Peter's directing, but we, we had a lot of sort of spin-off units um, doing specific action work and whatnot. Um, so but you were in, second unit, in general, right? there were a lot of people doing a lot of different roles. You know, Richard Taylor did multiple roles. You know, they're, mm. they're, you know so um, I was not alone in that. Um, I think that was one of the special aspects to Lord of the Rings is that, you know, Peter... Um, you know, and Fran and Richard Taylor and, you know, the people that, you know, you know, they created these organizations that was very much like an extended family. And so it was, it was, it was not like, Hey, you know, you're just doing this one thing. We're paying you to do this one thing. It was very much, Oh, can you help us over there too? That's great. Let's do it. It was, it was, it was more like a family getting together to make a movie than, you know, then a bunch of different companies, you know, kind of working together, you know, um, and I, th I think that's what made it such a special um, environment. And because it was over such a long period of time and because the project kind of grew over that time, you know, we all got to grow with it rather than, you know, everything being definitive at the start. 
you know, don't forget that when these movies were initially being developed, um, when it was Miramax before New Line took over, mm -hmm. they were being developed as two movies, right? And uh, and then became three movies when New Line took over. So it it was, you know, an evolving process and the kind of uh, approach to filmmaking that Peter has um, and the different companies that he created down there is really great at being able to grow with things and, and, and to be inclusive and not to be exclusive. So I think it was a wonderful environment that he created. Okay. Per dirvela molto semplicemente, non era da solo ovviamente a lavorare nel gruppo di Peter Jackson e via, ma erano tante persone, ognuno con il loro ruolo, ma la cosa più interessante che ci ha detto è che in realtà non è eh, che ogni persona lì lavorava su un qualcosa di diverso, no, ognuno lì era a disposizione del progetto, di un progetto che cresceva costantemente insieme a come cresceva il gruppo che lavorava a quel progetto. Quindi, ad esempio, se qualcuno, se Peter aveva bisogno di qualcuno per fare un qualcosa, glielo chiedeva e quel qualcuno magari era disponibile a fare quel qualcosa. Quindi era una grande famiglia, era una famiglia estesa, come ci ha detto Dick, è stato bellissimo quando ha detto che sembrava una famiglia che cercava di fare un film, che lavorava, che ha fatto un film. Era una grande famiglia che, se ci fate caso, è quello che ci hanno ribadito anche altri, le altre persone, gli altri ospiti che abbiamo avuto con noi. Quindi il concetto è quello. Peter Jackson lavora in questo modo. Una grande famiglia dove ognuno aiuta l'altro. E io direi che i risultati si sono visti. Yeah, okay. so it, it's really interesting because some of the other folks that we've interviewed, the consistent sort of theme in their interview is, is just what you mentioned. Um, I, even in, in interviewing Sarah McLeod the other week, um, we kind of said, hey, was that Hobbit feel that you get from the film? Was that present on set? And she said, absolutely. It was oh, absolutely yeah. there. Yeah. No, I, and I mean, and to, yeah, so no, definitely. And it was great because it because they created a, a great culture that, you know, that that when you showed up, you you like, you know, you got into it and then you continued on with it. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not something that, you know, like everybody became part of it. You know, it's, it's not like people were all of a sudden like, oh, you're not, you know, you're not part of it. You're, you're working, but you're not really, you know, it was very much inclusive. I would say specifically to your question, um, you know, producing of any type, being a producing, co-producing, executive producing, associate producing, you know, in the end, your job is to create, um, to help create an environment that gives the director what they need and to help like solve whatever problem exists so that the director can again get what they need you know that's your priority is trying to do whatever they whatever you can to make sure that the director has what they need to to fulfill their vision you know and um and sometimes that means you step in and you do some things maybe you aren't that you know familiar with but you do whatever you can to deliver and so i think that that was you know, one element to why I ended up doing sort of different things and why, again, I was not alone in that. Um, a lot of other people did multiple things. Um, in terms of the direct, the, the additional unit directing, I can speak to that if you first want to translate. Let's, let's talk yeah. about the co-producing thing. I would, thing I would because have just, just, just yeah. a second. Yep. Allora, per ribadire quello che abbiamo detto prima, che ha detto prima anche il nostro Rick, cioè che eh, era un ambiente in cui ognuno cercava di contribuire a quella che è la visione del regista, e quindi cercava di apportare quanto più possibile una, un aiuto a quella che, erano, quella che erano le volontà del regista e del, di quella che era appunto la sua visione per il film. Quindi era un ambiente inclusivo, dove tu non venivi escluso, ma anzi veniva incluso, l'importante ovviamente è, è quello di cercare di eh, conciliare con quella che è la visione del regista. E, yeah, so, eh. so I come from a military background um, for, for the US government. And so you really like an XO, right? You're an executive officer. It's like you execute the vision that's put forward by the director and, and you know, in, under any means possible, right? Sometimes it's not what you necessarily anticipate. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, again, uh, Peter created an environment which I really took to heart, which was, you know, wanting, you know, in the end, everybody thinking like a filmmaker. If everybody's being creative in whatever they're doing, mm -hmm. you know, they're able to help think and maybe create something that that causes Peter to go, oh, that's great. In fact, I'm going to use it this way or I'm going to or maybe he thinks of an even better idea, you know, Um 
there's a lot of, you know, it's directing is a very difficult job. And, and, you know, some directors, um, you know, take something and, um, you know, they make it, they make it good. Right. You know, um, but there are some directors, they're special ones. And I think Peter Jackson is one of them. And, and Bob Zemeckis is, an, is obviously another of them where, you know, if you give an idea that's in 2d, they're able to turn it into 3d. They, they make, you know, they don't just, they, they don't just see something and go, Oh yeah, let, that's a great idea. I'm going to use it. Right. There's no ego in that. Whatever's the best idea. I'm going to, you know, make the most of it, but they also then elevate it to something even more special. And I think yeah. Zemeckis and, and Peter Jackson are really, you know, in that category of filmmaker. Okay. Next yeah. one. We yeah. can go. Yeah. Abbiamo, abbiamo ripetuto la stessa, la stessa cosa abbiamo detto prima, cioè che eh, si cercava di raggiungere sempre un livello superiore, un livello migliore. E insomma, dovete immaginare la, il set di, dei film dove ovviamente eh, abbiamo visto, eh, abbiamo avuto Peter Jackson come regista, come effettivamente una grande famiglia, dove ognuno aiutava l'altro. E ripeto, i risultati si sono visti, quindi... Ecco, come dire, è, è la migliore, questa a quanto pare è la migliore strategia, cioè essere inclusivi mm. e far capire a chi lavora sul set che ognuno può dare una propria mano. L'importante è quello di conciliare la visione, ovviamente, del regista. Can I, e, can I also, yeah. can I scusi in one other thing? Yeah. Yes, in please. Um, in the producing led to the directing because one of the things that happened when we were in, in, in pre-production is Peter went and visited George Lucas and he saw this thing George Lucas was doing that no one else around the world was doing. It was, it was a new thing and it was called previs. Now previs is being done everywhere. There's every visual effects facility has a previs, de previs department. Commercials do previs, movies use previs, TV show uses previs. But back then, the only person in the world that was doing it was George Lucas. Peter saw that, came back to... New Zealand was like, Rick, I want us to create a previs department. And so I basically spent time putting one together. And what that is, is that's basically Peter already was storyboarding. You know, when you draw out, you know, mm -hmm. that's something Peter did. Like Hitchcock, he did the entire movies, you know, storyboarding. Mm -hmm. But previs is basically getting animated, right, shots so that you can actually see an animated version of the shot, either, you know, with a pan and a stick figure or whatever walking across or, a, right. you know, a big eagle flying or whatever it may be, you know? So previous was a new technique to be able to figure out what the shot could be. And Peter really wanted to make the most of it. And he did. So I put together that department for him and that was sort of, As a result, I was, you know, because I was in every meeting with him or most, a lot of the meetings with him, not every, but a lot of the meetings with him. And because I was involved with this previous department, it was natural then when they need to add another unit, to, you know, for me to then start directing on that unit, because I had a clear understanding of what Peter wanted. I'd been in the room when he was talking about these different shots and sequences. Ragazzi, ha detto una cosa che è estremamente interessante, soprattutto per persone come me, eh, per cinefili come, come me, e soprattutto per persone che studiano cinema. Praticamente, come Giuseppe, tra l'altro, mi sta aiutando anche Recal in chat, quindi lo ringrazio. Eh, lui, il nostro Rick, ha messo insieme un dipartimento di eh, pre-produzione o comunque di previsualizzazione. Praticamente, che cosa fanno? Cer in questo dipartimento mostrano come potrebbero venire le scene e quindi una sorta di anteprima, una sorta di storyboard. Infatti lui, Rick ha citato lo storyboard perché lo storyboard è proprio quello, cioè quando tu vai a delineare le varie scene prima di girare il film, cercando di capire come le varie scene potrebbero venire a film ultimato e quindi tu vai a prefigurare il film. Ed è esattamente quello a cui lui, Rick, si è dedicato con Peter Jackson e fra, fra l'altro ehm, prendendo ispirazione da George Lucas quindi è stato a quanto pare il primo che ha fatto una cosa del genere George Lucas per l'universo ovviamente di Star Wars come ben sappiamo e lui ha lavorato soprattutto su quell'aspetto oltre ovviamente a lavorare come eh, regista dirigendo alcune delle unità alcuni degli attori del, della trilogia e per far questo lui Rick doveva conoscere molto bene quelle che erano le volontà 
di Peter Jackson, infatti lui passava molto tempo a parlare con Peter Jackson. Dato che, eh, una, una domanda uh-huh. per Rick Paul, ehm, dato che passava molto tempo con, con Peter Jackson ehm, per parlare come dirige gli attori, ma è vero che Peter Jackson eh, aveva i pantaloncini corti anche con la neve? Faceva <ride> cioè, okay. Perché io ho visto varie, varie foto dove yeah, Peter yeah, stava yeah. con You're i pantaloncini right. sulla, sulle montagne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Neve. So, so you, you filmed obviously across multiple seasons for three years. Um, and and uh, there are pictures of Peter Jackson in his shorts. Um, is it true that he wore shorts even in the snow, in the coldest of weather? That he... <laughs> yeah, I think I only saw him wear pants once. I, he, That's too I funny. Mean, he was, yeah, it was, I was always amazed because I would be wearing five layers, you know, mm-hmm. I was always <laughs> cold. You know how people, when they're really old, they're always cold? Typical I was Californian. Cold. Yeah, but he, <laughs> he's so, so strong and he was like, oh, what's the big deal? Right. Um, but, you know, one other thing about Previs is, you know, now Previs is used in video games and I've been able to mm. work on a, a video game for Sony and I, it was a great experience for me. And it was great to see how Previs has grown because it really is a helpful tool for any storyteller in the visual medium to really, you know, be able to figure out what they want to do and then to be able to show others, you know, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm, you know, this is how I see it. Yeah. And um, so it's 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 a one it's become a wonderful step in the visual process in movies in TV in video games you know and I think it'll continue on so that's pretty cool. Quindi per rispondere alla domanda che la mia domanda grandissima domanda su, su Peter Jackson i pantaloncini c'era lì che da una parte che indossava cinque strade quindi cinque maglioni e poi dall'altra vedevi Peter Jackson che andava in, in giro tranquillamente con i pantaloncini come se fosse un uniforme e so, abbiamo visto già le immagini poi la cosa interessante tornando al tecnico è che il lavoro di Rick era essenzialmente quello di capire cosa voleva il regista e mostrare agli attori e agli altri, altri tecnici quello che sarebbe dovuto essere il risultato basandosi su uh, quello che voleva Peter Jackson quindi era a tutti gli effetti l'interprete di Peter Jackson con gli attori e con gli altre persone che erano sul set ok, next one yep, sorry no, that's Prossima... great, super helpful oh, great, great. prossima domanda ok, so um, you, you had in your experience as second unit director, right? You hadn't necessarily planned to come on board and take on that role, but you did. And in so doing, you were able to direct acting greats like Ian McKellen, um, Christopher Lee. There's one scene in particular, I think we've got a picture of you um, directing them. Um, Tell us what that was like, because it had to just be top. Well, I mean, yeah, it was, it was, It was, you know, obviously it was an amazing experience and I was really blessed that Peter, um, you know, was, was uh, you know, was okay and asked me to do it. And, and you know, I, um, uh, I'll, I'll always be indebted to him for letting me, you know, have that experience because it, it's, a, it's a unique experience that, you know, not a lot of people get to do. Um, so I, I will just always, always be just so appreciative that um that he felt comfortable in, in you know having me do that do that role um basically uh i was at helms deep um with john mahaffey who was uh directing what, uh, what at the time was i think it was called unit two i mean he switched we always were switching the names of the, of the different units but john was directing the the helms deep battle and i was there with him and i got called to the set Um, at the end of rap, which we were doing nights. So that meant I showed up at, at Peter's set for his breakfast and mm-hmm. was basically, that's when, you know, uh, he and Caro Cunningham, which Caro is his AD and eventually became uh, his producer. And she's just amazing woman. Um, and they basically said, Hey, you know, on Monday, we want to start you directing um, uh, the wizard fight. So that was, you know, that it was, that was the, my, my turnaround <laughs> was to like, you know, over the weekend to then get on to days first off and to start doing that. Now I was lucky that my set was also next door to Peter's so I could ask him questions while I was going through and that was really helpful. But um, getting to work uh, with Ian and Christopher was amazing. You know, they are, their talent just, you know, immense. And I learned so much from them. I think I got more out of it 
um, than anyone. <laughs> um, learning, you know, how they liked to work and what was the best way to, to, to handle the sequences. Remember, these are action sequences. So I was working with them in as ways into the action and then you know, off and on throughout the action for close-ups. Mm -hmm. And then the other shots I was doing were with the stunt doubles. You know, right. because obviously it was a very physical mm -hmm. scene. So, um, yeah, do, do you want me to stop and you translate? No, no, no. You can, you, you can, you can go ahead. So, uh, so it, it, what, one of the things that I learned and, and that Peter was great about, and it's something that, like, I always – keep in mind, and I wish people would do more of in movies, which is just remembering that everything needs to connect back to character. And so I was really lucky to be doing a sequence that was so, so specifically connected to the characters of Gandalf and Saruman, you know, that the, the action, you know, Peter wanted was, you know, very crunchy and like two old geezers fighting it out. Right? <laughs> and so that's very easy easy to kind of visualize in your head mm -hmm. when you're then trying to direct something like that and come up with shots and anything that kind of made it crunching. Oh, uh, you know, just kind of sure. um, like it would be if you had two octogenarians fighting it out, right. it had special powers. Right. So that really made it fun for me and it made it um, easier for me in terms of the first time ever sitting in the director chair, trying to, you know, make sure we got not just, um, you know, it wasn't hard to get great performances out of Ian and Christopher because they were such great actors. But in terms of with the stunt doubles, even, you know, getting great performances out of them and, mm -hmm. and they did amazing work. And then also trying to work out what were the best angles to try to make the most of that sequence and, and, and give Peter, you know, as much as possible so that when he sat down in the editing room, he could really cut together um, a fun sequence rather than wishing he had something else. Right, right. So my, my goal was to always make sure that he never had to reshoot anything. And if that meant I shot maybe more than you would ordinarily shoot, I just wanted to make sure that nothing ever had to get reshot. Right. You know? um, yeah. Ok, Isley. Allora, ragazzi, tra traducerò ovviamente a cercando di riassumere i concetti principali. Tra l'altro c'è anche Rekal che vi sta aiutando in chat. Quindi datevi un'occhiata anche a quello che scrive lui. Per dirlo vera, molto semplicemente, lui è stato, uso proprio la parola che ha detto, benedetto da Peter Jackson per aver potuto coprire quel ruolo e dirigere alcuni dei migliori attori che eh, già all'epoca, purtroppo Christopher Lee ormai non c'è più, eh, alcuni dei migliori attori di sempre, come appunto Christopher Lee e Ian McKellen, e fu ehm, per lui molto particolare, come cosa? Perché stavano dirigendo delle scene eh, per il, la battaglia del fosso di Helm e il giorno dopo avrebbero dovuto dirigere invece la battaglia tra i vecchi, <ride> cioè tra i, maghi, tra i maghi anziani, quindi la battaglia dove Saruman combatte con Gandalf sulla torre di Orsta, che ce la, ce, ce la ricordiamo molto bene. E lui ha imparato molto ovviamente da questa esperienza, dalla, uh, sua, da, questa, da questa sua esperienza appunto di dirigere questi due grandi attori e, um, e nulla, è stata per lui una cosa molto, molto affascinante e fra l'altro ha parlato anche della connessione con i personaggi, cioè quanto è importante avere, poter avere questa connessione con i personaggi che tu vai a dirigere. E, e la cosa la, la trova ovviamente oltre a insegnargli tanto è stato per lui eh, molto divertente anche una cosa che lo ha molto rilassato a quanto pare e va bene so as a follow on question to that if I may because I, I just I love that particular um, scene it's, it's so cool um, but we talked a little bit about the previs was that an element did that come into play with this particular scene it, because it is so physical there's so much movement and as you describe it it is it is really crunchy it's gritty it's sort of yeah. pieced together and so did you have this sort of vision of what that would be or did it sort of come together that way yeah so um sorry a calls coming in let me decline it um yeah like um i think One of the one of the many great things about Pete is that um, process, right? Um, back then, really then played into um, it. There were there were there were a lot of great benefits to his process. So he storyboarded everything. Mm -hmm. Very few directors uh, storyboarded everything back then or even now. 
Um, you know, he just, um, that was his process. Mm -hmm. You know, when Zemeckis uh, directed, he would storyboard the most complicated sequences that were often visual effects sequences. But Peter did the entire film, right? Wow. Each of the films. So Previs um, was a portion of those films. So when each of these different uh, directors that were doing action stuff that, that, you know, if Peter wasn't there, they would have storyboards they could refer to. Mm -hmm. And they would sometimes have previs that they could also refer to. And it wasn't just helpful to them and to me, but it was also helpful to the crew because they could then go to the crew. And go, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're working on. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, so in terms of um, the wizard fight and or thing, um, you know, it's an action sequence. So there's only so much storyboards, but there were some key shots in the sequence that Peter had, thought through in advance already, you know, in terms of the shape of the fight that mm -hmm. were prevised, right? And then in addition to that, in the previs, there was a model, you know, you've, it's a 3D model, right? And there was a red line where, you know, the set stopped and where the visual effects began. Yeah, so in that yeah. shot where Gandalf was spinning around and then mm -hmm. we, we pan up with it and he goes flying up, you know, yep. and then, you know, so that, it's just all those elements helped everybody understand which part was going to fit where and, you know, who, where the handoff would be. So, you know, his process really helped, you know, me and it really helped everyone else that wasn't, you know, that was directing a, a different unit. But it also helped all the different departments. It really helps with the cohesion of the movie, right? Yeah. And I think that's very unique because a lot of times people do things just for their process. Right. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. If that means that they got what they needed on the day, God bless them. But Pete also had a process that everybody was able to benefit from. And by the way, that didn't mean what Peter storyboarded or previs was exactly what he did on the day for his own stuff. It just meant that that was that helped him get to where he needed to go. It gave that line of sight. What One takeaway that I'm getting from you and from others specifically is, number one, Peter Jackson was meticulous yes. in his sort of planning and his, his system, his process. Yes. But at the same time, you know, you don't want 500 sort of mini directors. You still need one lead. But he gave you the space and the room to create and kind of put forward your ideas. And he was flexible enough to work with those as well. Yeah, I mean, but you know, like in the end, I mean, you were doing what, you know, what he had directed you to do, right? And that, sure. and that, did, that wasn't just, you know, at the director level, that was also, that was happening at the DP level. Andrew Lesney had to make, mm. communicate, make sure all the DPs on these different sets were doing what needed to be done to make it a cohesive thing. Because remember, so often, a lot of the times, we weren't necessarily doing complete sequences. We were doing bits of things, parts right. of it that all need to come together in the same way that Peter might direct a scene with Elijah and Sean, you know, four months or let's say five months into production and then direct the second half of that scene or sorry, the other half of the scene. So you're they're cutting back and forth between characters, right? Like, you know, nine months later. Right. So, you know, the, to be able to keep all that like in his head was remarkable and to be able to 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 communicate what mm -hmm. he needed to to the rest of us was equally remarkable, you know. So, um, yeah. Okay. Allora, traducendo sempre in maniera riassuntiva, ragazzi, io farò il riassunto dei concetti chiave dopo che c'è il recal in com nei commenti che sta facendo un lavorone. Quindi mi raccomando, dare, dare un'occhiata anche ai commenti. E... Per farla breve, Peter Jackson era un perfezionista, da quello che posso capire, perché faceva lo storyboard di tutto. Come vi dicevamo prima, lo storyboard, chi studia cinema, ma di, sol di solito si conosce, si sa cos'è lo storyboard, eh, chi ha mai lavorato nel cinema, ma non solo, è eh, la, 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 come dire, la tecnica che permette di previsualizzare come verranno girate alcune scene e quale potrebbe essere, quale dovrebbe essere il risultato finale. Ebbene, Peter Jackson, esattamente come Zemeckis, faceva lo storyboard di tutto, persino delle delle scene d'azione. Ci ha raccontato appunto nello specifico una, una scena d'azione che è stata girata e vi invito a leggerla nei commenti tutta la, tutto quello che ci ha detto, così vi fate un'idea molto più chiara. E, va bene. Eh, leggo. I want to read uh, two comments. Oh, ok. We've got some audience comments. Ok. Oh. Voglio, voglio ringraziare innanzitutto John Kramer 
John Kramer asked to Rick uh, to work with Michael Bay. Rick, He's do you want to work? If I've ever worked with Michael Bay, yeah. No, no, I have not. I have no, not. I've worked it, with Michael Bay, but I've never. People worked. asking, people asking, if you want to work with Michael Bay. Oh, if I want to work with Michael Bay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it would depend on the project. I think it's, I think, you know, some of the work he does is amazing. Um, it's just, you know, like everything, it depends on the, on the type of film he's doing, but sure. I think that Michael Bay doesn't give us, get as much credit as, as he deserves. You know, there's some incredible stuff he's done. No, I, no, I, I don't know why, but they ask it that. I don't know. <ride> anyway, I hope that, I hope so. Quindi John, ti ringrazio e, e spero che prima o poi Rick possa lavorare con Michael Bay. Ringrazio anche Carmelo, bellissima, bel format, un grandissimo grazie a Frank e Kelly, grazie a chi sta dicendo se non come si vede. Grazie a voi ragazzi, grazie a voi che ci state aiutando. Gli altri commenti ragazzi li sto salvando in modo tale che li faremo alla fine a Rick. Quindi mi raccomando, se avete dei, eh, delle domande specifiche da fare a Rick, fatecele, io le salvo e alla fine gliele porgeremo ovviamente le, le domande più interessanti va bene allora next one so uh moving on what out of all the scenes that you directed what and maybe we've already touched on it what was your favorite to direct you know i did a lot of a lot of bits um i mean i i did like doing the tree beards um some of the tree beard work with mary mm -hmm. you know um i really like uh Uh, Dom and Billy and um, so I had a lot of fun doing that and that was interesting with this huge animatronic puppet that Weta Workshop had created um, but yeah I mean in the end what's closest to my heart is probably the wizard the wizard fight being the first thing I ever did that's probably the, the, the such a, such closest, a cool scene. closest to my heart yeah. Um, but yeah that'd probably be the answer to it okay la scena con Gandalf e Helm's Deep. Yep. Okay. Ovviamente, ragazzi, <ride> è quella del Helm's Deep, yep. quella della, della, del fosso di Hell. Mm -hmm. e, va bene, andiamo avanti. Next one. Mettiamo prima la domanda in italiano e poi quella in inglese. So, Prego. you also had a little bit of a hand in sort of some EA work on the Lord of the Rings video game, right? Yeah, so... So, Tell you know, while we, were making, like. yeah, while we were making rings, Electronic Arts was making, you know, the video game. And there were actually a couple of iterations that they were doing. Um, and so uh, at one point, um, you know, there's always this tug, you know, kind of back and forth friction, you know, between uh, the, in, in this case, you know, a video, a video game company that was was told they could have everything and and on the filmmaking side, you want to give them, you know, what you can to help make sure the video game's great. But you also, in this case, there was concern of, well, we don't want certain things to be revealed. For the Because the video time. came out first. The video That's game right. the video came, came out came prior out to the movie. What video games? Yeah. Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings. Oh, game. okay. And yeah. so this was a particular instance in which... It was a unique situation. People yeah. always talk about transmedia. This was truly transmedia things you mm -hmm. know you basically had overlapping of different types of mediums which is great but it's just about trying to find the right synergy um and there was one moment where uh they they wanted some some uh, help with with um the adr they were doing so many different things and they weren't as familiar a they were not familiar with our actors and b they were not familiar as familiar with you know the what we were doing with Lord of the Rings as, as we were. So as a result, I was sent over to, uh, to Sydney and we did um, the ADR work with, you know, some of the actors like, like Ian McKellen um, that went into the game. Cause that, as you know, there's a lot of VO work, a lot of voiceover work. Yep. Right. ADR stands for automated dialogue replacement. It's an mm -hmm. old movie term, but in video games, it's voiceover work. There's a lot right. of voiceover work required for this, you know, the, the, the scenes that you get between the different levels, but also, as you know, throughout playing the video game. So I, I you know, went in and, and helped out with doing the, you know, that directing on the, on the VO work um, for, for the game. Okay. Per, vi dico la parte iniziale che io la reputo molto più interessante. E, mh, praticamente all'inizio, dato che i videogiochi che, su cui eh, Rick ha lavorato sono usciti prima dei film, mm -hmm. c'è stato un momento in cui si era creato 
a, 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 Rick ha detto ha parlato di frizione quindi io posso immaginare un conflitto tra la uh, EA cioè la, la casa di produzione, la casa di sviluppo dei videogiochi e, e quindi chi produceva i videogiochi su cui anche lui ha lavorato e i produttori della trilogia che in realtà non volevano svelare molto ed è molto interessante ragazzi io quasi quasi ve lo porterò sul canale o non qui magari su Twitch il videogioco di cui sta parlando Rick perché voglio appunto andare a capire effettivamente a cosa sarà stata dovuta questa frizione tra la casa di sviluppo e i produttori perché magari avranno, svilu- avranno svelato troppo all'interno dei videogiochi andremo a vedere ve ne, ve ne parlerò ancora it's an interesting point Rick because we actually do a live on Twitch where we yeah. do some of the gameplay and exactly. specifically Francesco is doing um, Shadow of Mordor right right yeah. now and so we've got a, obviously a pretty big fan base that's interested in the video yeah, game yeah like this was the this was the first one right they've really right. expanded since so it was you know it was very early days but um but I do think that you know you know it was it was tough because they have a job to do which is try to make this thing as great as possible mm-hmm. we don't want to get in the way of that but we are also trying to Deliver the Keep movie. some surprises. <laughs> well, but we're also, yeah, and we're also just trying to deliver the movie, you know? Right, I mean, right. So it's, it becomes an additional thing. And so it's just a matter of how, how to, you know, try to do it in as graceful a way as possible, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think that, uh, you know, we learned, a, everybody learned a lot in that process. Um, and I, I wish that more projects, you know, obviously Marvel, you know, there's certain big, you know, entities out there that are able to do it, Star Wars and whatnot. But uh-huh. I do love it when you're able to kind of make things concurrent and think through like, oh, this will be here and it will help set up something over there. You know, sure. Lord of the Rings wasn't that per se, but I do like the way games, you know, have evolved and way they're, they're, they're becoming more filmic. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's such, it's such a great, you know, avenue. I mean, I actually got to direct um, on a VR game for Sony called Blood and Truth. And it was a great experience to get to see how they um, they were making that, you know, that was the largest VR game ever made at that point. And um, just to get to be a part of that process, get to help work on story and, um, you know, get to work with the folks there. It, you know, games is just this wonderful combination of of filmmaking and and VFX and obviously gameplay, you know, but it's just the, all the different tools that they're using. Um, is quite remarkable. So it's nice to see, you know, all these different mediums evolving. Okay. We have to remember Next that. Slide. Blood Next blood and truth. But, yeah. but one thing I want to add to the game part is that, you know, games like movies, you know, it's all about world creation. And I think people are starting to really understand that now. And, you know, obviously yeah. Marvel and the Star Wars universe and Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter have all been really helpful in kind of helping people get their heads around world creation you know, mm-hmm. character and creating worlds are pretty, pretty awesome. Well, it's huge for, I mean, again, pulling my military experience in, it's huge for us in the military, right? In training mm-hmm. helicopter pilots or, you know, wh- what have you. Um, that that world and scenario creation, that's that's what we do every day to, to prepare yeah, uh, to defend the country. Yep. Yeah, storytelling, <laughs> characters, and world creation. Those, those three, right? They're all super in cool. Game. Kelly parla del suo, del suo lavoro iper patriottico. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> America. Make America great America. Again. <laughs> Ok, next one, next one. E, allora, la prossima domanda ve la spiego un attimo. Oh, eh, this is my favorite. Esatto, Rick, come vi ho detto prima, compare anche come, eh, sia nelle versioni estese dei film, ma anche come controfigura mm-hmm. di Gollum. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Quindi gli chiederà come è stato fare la controfigura di Gollum. So, Rick, I feel like there's a little bit of embarrassment on your part here, but I love this. I I am so excited. I've watched these clips over and over and over again. I get so excited about them um, because, again, they give you a sense of what the set was really like and what, right. the, what the process was like, right, right. In, in the community. It's just so cool. Yeah, um, yeah. And it was cool to see that you were sort of, um, when they needed you, you jumped in like that's just what you did on a day-to-day well, basis yeah and again but i wasn't alone in that i think that right. was pretty universal and i think you know if anybody ever gets the chance you know the extended cut dvds have these great documentaries on them made by michael pellerin who's a really great filmmaker and documentarian and um and his team they did a wonderful job making those and they really do show the environment um because it was like i said earlier a family affair in a way. And we were mm-hmm. all just doing what we could. Um, 
the embarrassment about the Gollum thing is just simply one, I can't act. Um, and, <laughs> and I can't, and, and two, I can't act anywhere near like Andy circus. So like not having Andy there is a huge problem. Right. And he couldn't, he was on another set, so he couldn't be there for that. And then the third was that I am not as strong as physical as, as like, you know, physically built as Andy. So when I put on the, the, you know, the basically it's a pajama outfit, you know, <laughs> in, in Andy, it's like tight fitting. He's all muscular and he looks fabulous. <laughs> and in me, it's like, you know, saggy diapers, so it's just, <laughs> you know, not exact. It's kind of a bummer that there was a camera around to actually show that outside of just having something as digital reference as, as reference for the VFX guy, animators. Right. Um, that was the only reason why I was there was just, actually less reference and more just oh something for the actors to play off of in the space you mm -hmm. know or for the camera to play off in the space i don't think anybody needed to use me as reference <laughs> i i i think it's Formative such a great actor. clip if you haven't seen it make a point don't to watch <laughs> that in the extended dvd watch something else <laughs> Allora ragazzi, io vi consiglio di guardare la versione estesa, no, immagino che tutti voi l'abbiate guardata, la versione estesa del Signore Anelli, dove ci sono anche i, i, le varie, eh, i vari cut, i varie eh, dietro le quinte, dove c'è appunto Rick che racconta anche le, varie, le sue varie esperienze sul set e così via. Ebbene, l'esperienza di fare la controfigura di Gollum è stata problematica per tre punti principali, cioè quella che eh, non voleva, o comunque non, non, non sapendo recitare, ovviamente nella sua, nella sua concezione di se stesso, di Rick, e il fatto che non poteva, ehm, come dire, dire nessun tipo di battuta associata appunto a Andy, a Andy Serkis, quindi di Gollum, eh, e soprattutto che non aveva la stessa prestanza fisica di Andy Serkis, e quindi si sentiva parecchio in difficoltà, estremamente in difficoltà. E, chiede John Kramer, uh -huh. can you read this? Uh, if he eated... Oh! Uh, <ride> Did you ever, did you ever in, in your sort of stand-in work, um, we see you kind of doing a lot of more physical work, kind of shuffling in and out sort of in an animal way throughout the woods and the rocks and things. Um, did you, did you ever eat raw fish? That's what he's asking, John Kramer. No, <laughs> no raw fish, no. too bad. You know what? I wasn't that committed. <laughs> All right. So, but on a more serious level, yeah. you, you have some other um, clips in, uh, in the sort of behind the scenes uh, clips where you, you act alongside Peter Jackson as a Corsair in that's in Re return of the King. Correct. What? Uh, his work is the, the Corsair pirate. Yeah. Mm. That's return. Of the right. King. Yeah. Return and so King. you, you acted right alongside Peter Jackson in that role. And then you also tell us a little bit about um, your work um, doing some, uh, some initial film or shots in bag end. Oh, right, right. Okay, well, the Corsair Pirate thing, I, look, to be clear, this is a cameo. This is more like, <laughs> this is something we did it's with... It's a lead role. No, this is something we pirate. did with a lot of friends, you know, um, when people would visit the set or, uh, you know, like Peter was kind enough when I visited on King Kong, he, he let me be a gunner, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. shooting at King Kong. So it's just something you you do with your friends. And so... No small role, Rick. Yeah, so, um, so the Corsair Pirate scene... Actually, it had Andrew Lesney, um, our director of photography, who was amazing, mm -hmm. um, you know, God rest his soul. Um, and uh, um, he's definitely missed. And, uh, and Richard Taylor, you know, head of Weta, a Weta Workshop. Um, and it had Gino Acevedo, who was the um, head prosthetics uh, designer um, and, uh, you know, really lovely guy. Um, you know, Richard and Gino are very tall, broad-shouldered, big, you know, strong strapping men, you know, um, Peter, you know, played, you know, played a, Peter actually played a real role, you know, I mean, he was the bosun and he, t he does a stunt, which he was, he was very proud of. We, we, you know, we had a lot of fun with, um, where, you know, he gets shot by an arrow. Um, so Peter actually has a real role. The rest of us are just, you know, <laughs> filling in the frame. Um, Andrew and I were, were the least physical looking of the group. So we were, you know, we were there kind of at the end of the sequence and, uh, um, but it was a lot of fun. And it was one of those things where it was the last shot, you know, of the day. And so um, at the end, there's this response where um, the ghosts are, 
are going to attack the ship. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so we're all supposed to look surprised. And so I, 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 I think I, yeah, I lucked out or didn't luck out, however you want to look at it, at, at, at having that, the close up of surprise, which is like a hundred mil lens. So it's quite a long lens. It felt way too close to me. I did not have the acting chops for that kind of a frame. And, um, and uh, uh, a friend of mine um, uh, was standing next to camera, basically telling me how he wanted to go home. We were taking too long, <laughs> too many takes. You know, he wanted to go to his family. You know, he, I was taking away from him, him having time with his kids, you know, um, that kind of thing. So he really gave me a hard time in between. I, just, I think it was just a couple of takes, but in between the takes. So it was a little nerve wracking, you know, to have that kind of level of, you know, focus, but it was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, it just, it just shows how like Peter is able to kind of keep making the set fun and, you know, we are there, you know, we're making something, but we are playing too. Right. You know, you're, sure. you, know, you know, in terms of the word, you know, to play, like, you know, to act. Right. So I think that it was really great the way he would bring the crew on to set in front of camera, you know, when he could, um, it, you know, it was, it was, it was fun to do the, the, the bag end thing was more an exercise of, of, um, we, the art department had just finished or just, sorry, just created the bag end set. So it was like a plywood set. It hadn't been actually, you know, uh, you know, dressed. Totally developed. It didn't have the proper, you know, surfaces on it. It was mm -hmm. just a plywood shell and it just gotten done and it was the weekend and Peter was like, Hey, I'm going to take one of these little lipstick cameras, which was kind of a new thing back then. Everybody has GoPros now, but back then it was yeah. a big deal to have a camera that was like basically the size of your phone with the lens sticking out. Yeah. You know, like that. So, yeah. um, uh, so Peter basically got a few of us together. We went to the set and we recreated those scenes or recreated, the, did those scenes, um, with Bilbo showing up just after he snuck away from the party, you know, and he takes off the ring quite pleased with himself and he pockets it. And then Gandalf is sitting there and he calls him on it. And he, you know, they, they, they look, they realize, um, you know, basically he calls him on it and then he, and Bilbo ends up giving up the ring, which is of course a very special and unique moment, you know, um, in the history of the ring, the fact that someone actually gave it up physically mm -hmm. like that. So he drops it. And then, um, then you have the, the follow-up scene where Frodo comes in and, um, and, and ends up taking the ring um, and the back and forth with Gandalf. So originally Peter had me playing Bilbo and I was, Again, I think the theme of this talk is that I'm a bad actor. So, you know, <laughs> he was very disappointed in the early performances I was giving. So he fired me on the spot <laughs> at Bilbo, and he immediately took over. And he's a better actor than I am. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, you know, licked my wounds and I, I, I was moping around a little bit. So he in, instead had me then play Frodo. So he played Bilbo and then I played Frodo. And Charlie McClellan, who was our VFX producer at the time, um, played Gandalf where he had a stick and a big head on top of the stick. So that was representing how tall Gandalf would be in the frame compared to Peter and me as Hobbit size in this set. And also mm -hmm. it gave us an eye line. And then, um, and then uh, uh, um, we you know, played through. And at one point, um, I, you know, we realized that we needed a ring as a prop. And I was the only guy that had a ring on my finger, you know, um, so I took off my wedding ring and that became the prop. And um, and basically, uh, coincidentally, that following Monday um, or yeah, Monday or Tuesday, um, Dan Hanna, uh, art director, came in with a suitcase full of rings and Peter had to select the one ring and he selected one. And as Dad, Dan was leaving, I was thinking about how we'd just been using my ring as a prop and feeling like, you know, I was just like, you know, that ring, you know, felt like it had more essence to it than the, than the ring that, you know, we were, we had just been looking at. And so I mentioned it to Pete and he's like, Hey, yeah, you know what, that ring, it does feel like it's got more weight. Let's use that as the basis. So Dan came back and they took my wedding ring and they, they made a, a, a mold of it. And then they, you know, still kind of, you know, did some, did some work after that, but um, all those things were kind of interconnected. So it just shows how great it is to, you know, try different things, 
to, you know, Peter was using that experience to get his head around how he wanted to shoot back end. Um, but, you know, interesting things came from it. And we all kind of learned a bit ourselves, you know, about that process of what it's going to be like to deal with scale. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was really great that Peter did that. And everything about movie making and TV making, um, you know, and video games, everything, it's all about how you prepare, right? Sure. The more you can prepare, the better off you're going to be on the day. You know, um, the more you're going to get, you know, on the screen, so to speak, um, and the less you're going to waste. And Peter was really good about preparing. Allora, ragazzi, io vi farò il riassunto di due concetti chiave, altrimenti finirei di tradurre fra, fra una settimana. Da, ci ho, dato tanti, ho detto tantissime cose, Rick. Quindi io vi invito a leggere nello specifico i commenti di Recal nella chat, che io ringrazio infinitamente perché sta facendo un lavorone. Grazie, Recal. Quindi, per sapere parola per parola cosa ha detto Rick, leggete in chat. Però io, per riassumerla molto brevemente, <ride> mi ha fatto ridere perché... Una cosa che abbiamo capito è che Peter Jackson cercava di creare un ambiente bello, collaborativo e felice... E sul, sul set questo ce l'ha ripetuto ancora una volta poco fa e soprattutto abbiamo capito che Rick si reputava un attore del merda praticamente questa cosa mi dispiace perché in realtà non è propriamente così da, quello, da, da quel poco che ho visto ovviamente nei video che eh, sono disponibili io vi invito a guardare soprattutto nel, nel, dietro le scene dietro le quinte della, della missione stessa del Signore Anelli però diciamo che lui ci ha ribadito più volte a dire che non è questo grande attore che, che poi lui comunque è un tecnico quindi il suo ruolo non dovrebbe comunque essere quello Okay, the But next the, one. The one takeaway I got was that Rick Forrest has the one ring. Yeah. He has the one ring. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, 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 the initial, you know, basis But for it. Yeah. It's, he's not this apparel. No. It's, it's worth it. No, well, he actually, not actually be wearing... to be clear, this was my previous marriage. So okay, it's not, okay. It's not <laughs> this ring. It's actually, uh, uh, when we got, uh, sadly got divorced, um, my mother quite... Uh, She's always switched on. She said, I'll take that. And she put in the safety deposit box. So there you go. So okay. I, it's a, it's instead of me kind of losing it, you know, like, like, it, like the one ring was lost for, for centuries. Uh, my mother just put in the safety deposit box. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Next one. Ragazzi, siamo quasi arrivati alla fine. Questa yeah. è la penultima domanda. Quindi yeah. a breve we'll, leggeremo we'll, le vostre we're domande. We're almost wrapped and we'll have a couple audience questions for and, you. We want to be sensitive of your time. Because, oh, no, yeah, we are. Okay. Okay, just these my and the uh, favorite Turkish character. Okay. okay, yeah, I'm getting too wrapped up in the interview and I'm, I'm losing sense of time. Um, so tell us, were you a fan of Tolkien before all of this? Yeah. Was it so, easy for you to dive in? Yeah, so look, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't at the level uh, that I am now and I wasn't at the level that Christopher Lee was at where he would read the books every year, right? That's something he did every single year. And... Um, So I, I was not at that level, but um, mm -hmm. I was a fan. I, I had actually read them very late in life um, in my, at that time. Um, I was at university uh, doing a summer job to, you know, pay for, you know, my, my food. food and bills during, <laughs> during, you know, the next year. And I was working in the library where they, they in this one area they called the stacks, which is basically, you know, where books go to just get dusty. Mm. you know, and store it away. And I was supposed to be putting books away and I was doing that. And then I found this book that didn't, it didn't feel like it belonged with all the other books because all the other books were, were very much like um, bound the same way because they were for the most part, different professors, like dissertations or, you know, different research mm -hmm. projects. So, so in that section, they weren't, They weren't specifically like, you know, different novels. And sure. there was this very ornate looking, um, you know, binding that I saw that, you know, all the others were very plain, right? Just mm -hmm. a simple colored binding with like stenciled, you know, in gold lettering, you know, someone's dissertation, let's say. Then there was this one book and it was very ornate. I'm like, whoa, what's that? And I pulled it out and it was Lord of the Rings. And so I sat down and I started reading it, you know, I blew the dust off, you know, and I started reading it and it was like, Like, of course, it hooked me on the first page. And instead of working, I basically hid out in the stacks and read that book, you know, every day until I finished it. You know, I, was, I don't remember. It was a few days, uh, maybe three, four days, you mm -hmm. know, um, in the stacks that I, I just read it from cover to cover. I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't wait to get back to work just to, to not work and to read Lord of the Rings. So that- You're like the kid me, in the never ending story. Yeah, exactly. So that, yeah. that made me a fan. And um, 
And so when when Peter mentioned that he was, you know, going to make Lord of the Rings and asked if I wanted to work on it, I was immediately, you know, I just, you know, for me, it was just trying to figure out how it would work life wise, um, you know, but but I just I was just so happy that someone was actually talking about making it. And I really did feel I was a believer from the beginning in terms of Peter being the right person to make it, you know, because I mm -hmm. felt that, you know, it needed not just a filmmaker, but also an entrepreneur, which is what he is, you know, and, you know, the fact that he was able to, to have the vision to kind of create entities that could eventually create Lord of the Rings, you know, it needed that kind of person at the helm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are all sorts of things like Massive, for example, as a visual effects software program that Stephen Regulus created. It was like, you know, early days AI, you know, where you're actually creating digital figures and you're giving them a motion tree on how to fight and how to protect themselves so that you could have these casts of thousands in the frame beyond our, our uh, extras fighting that were actually just digital characters. You know, that program, you know, was created because of a conversation Stephen had with Peter and Peter saw the vision in that and like, you know, you know, supported it and helped, you know, fund it, you know, through, you know, through the movie. So it was, you know, it's just th that kind of project needed someone with that kind of vision sure. and um, not just an am amazing filmmaker, which he also is, you know, and then his partner, Fran Walsh is also an amazing filmmaker and an amazing mm -hmm. writer. And, you know, she, you know, the, the, you know, it's just, they're just such a great yin and yang, you know? Um, and, and then, you know, they had Philip Aboyans that came in as another great writer. He just kind of, you know, his mm -hmm. relationship with the early days with Richard Taylor and what, you know, what they had created together in terms of what a workshop, um, you know, and Fran had been around for that entire period. So there was a really amazing filmmaking team, not just one individual saying, I want to go make Lord of the Rings, right. you know? Um, and I think that is what, you know, made it so special and so doable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me reading the books way back when, and then thinking about it, the way, when Peter started talking about it as a movie, it, you know, the, the books are so vast. You needed a filmmaking team that could really take that on board. And of course, New Line coming in and, you know, them, you know, supporting and giving the vision. And even though it wasn't always, you know, smooth sailing between, you know, the filmmaking team and New Line, you know, never is. You know, there's that push and pull, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that like it took that kind of a company um, to say yes. Everybody else in Hollywood said no, right? Right. Everybody had an opportunity to say yes to Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. right? And it was New Line who actually said yes. You know, mm -hmm. so it's just, you know, again, it, it was kind of a perfect, uh, you know, semblance of people. You know, all, all the all the moons lined up, so to speak. Um, and that's what I felt when I was reading Lord of the Rings too. It all felt like this special world. I, I you know, you couldn't think of it any different way. Sorry. Allora, per, vi, vi traduco la parte iniziale in cui ci ha detto che uh, Rick essenzialmente ha conosciuto Tolkien in una, lavorando in una libreria. Lavorava in una libreria, si è imbattuto in questo libro, l'ha uh, ha iniziato a leggerlo e l'ha letto in una volta sola, in una volta sola o comunque possiamo definire, diciamo, in un'unica un tirata. E... What is the your Tolkien's character? Favorite, what? your preferred. Favorite. Yeah, so, so this is character. a question we ask every single yeah. person that comes on the show. It's our last that's question. Like, that's like saying, "What's your favorite movie?" or "What's your yeah. favorite book?" There's so yeah. many. Yeah, it's kind of it's tough. off. Oh, that's such a hard question. Yes, I don't know if I can say what's my favorite. Although you know, like I, I mean, I, Aragorn, I love. You know, it's a, what and and obviously what then Vigo did with that character. Um, But I, 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 there's something about Sam, you know, like, and it was something about in the casting of Sam with, with Sean Astin that he really delivered on, which is, you know, where he starts off um, and then, you know, you know, where he starts off, you know, uh, where he's eavesdropping and he, you know, he gets pulled into back in the bag and he's like, I'm, you know, I haven't been dropping no eaves, you know, like I, I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> he's all very like, you know, right. I'm just, the, I'm just the, I'm in the guy, background. Kind of, Yeah, over here, he's not, yeah. he's not in any way, you know, the alpha at all. Right. And then what, you know, what we get from him, you know, in Two Towers, you know, inspiring, um, you know, uh, Frodo to continue on when it's just so exhausting for him. Mm -hmm. And then Sam actually 
at the end there, you know, I can't carry the ring, but I, you know, I, basically I can't carry the ring, but I can carry you right up the mountain. The, the, that arc, you know, that, what that, what Sam goes through um, and you know, where he ends up is, is pretty amazing. That's not it's to take so, away the other characters, but it's yeah. so beautiful. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago mm. and it's one reason I love Sam so much is because he's so humble, but there's this, there's this humble courage that sort of drives the narrative forward and it drives so yeah. much of the, the character and the storyline forward. And Ma lo stesso Tolkien considerava Sam il vero eroe. Yeah, the so, real hero. Yeah, so, so you can say that in the yeah. letters. Yeah, yeah and, and I feel like you can, like I could give a, I could probably give a, an equally, you know, at least moving for me statement for each character on why they might be my sure. favorite. Because I think sure. Tolkien created that vast the world and that that amount of depth for each of those characters. But I am, you know, and I am proud of all, all what, what all the actors did was amazing, you know, and I just, um, I, you know, I, I think if, if we're talking specifically about Sean, about Sam, I think Sean really, you know, delivered a wonderful performance, you know, a, a, you know, one that one that one that lasts, you know, mm -hmm. for that specific mm -hmm. character to handle that arc, you know, mm -hmm. um, and obviously I think the same for all the other actors, too. So but yeah, Sam, I don't know, it's hard not to. Sorry not to, not to love him. Right, right, right. You're telling me allora. I have to? No, okay. <ride> Ragazzi, penso che si è capito, il suo personaggio preferito è Sam. E le, le motivazioni sono quelle che in realtà rendono Sam quello che è, cioè il vero eroe della storia, essere lui che ha portato in realtà, ha portato Frodo e l'anello fino al Monte Fato e così via. Quindi Sam, ragazzi, è stato eletto Sam. Can we do a couple audience questions? Last question. And Do that, we have one more? Yeah. Oh, I thought that was the last this, one. This, this question oh, is so yeah, important. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. uh, yeah, we did talk... Ragazzi, la, la, you la domanda sugli anelli del potere. You and I yes. talked about this, Rick. Um, so I already kind of know the answer. Okay. But the, the audience must know. Yes. Have you seen the rings of power? And the answer is no. Ah! I'm actually waiting. And the reason why I'm waiting is because I want to see it with my folks and my wife, uh, Sabrina. So, um, so Sabrina and I are going to go up to, uh, to, to Stanford where I grew up, Palo Alto there. And, um, and we're going to watch it with right? my folks over the Thanksgiving holiday, right? It's a That's big a holiday. It's a great Thanksgiving thing it's a to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually, um, I'm actually going to, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm planning on watching, both uh rings of power and then also i i haven't watched the dragons you know dragons either so i've, I've got those two yeah. large uh you know um fantasies in front of me over my holiday viewing so yeah. i'm really looking forward to that um but yeah sorry i don't have any i don't have a statement for you you know um no worries yeah. you'll have to, better, you'll have to better, report back better, better. <laughs> Yeah. <ride> eh, ragazzi non l'ho visto quindi fermiamoci con le domande su, sulla, sugli anelli del potere eh, we can start with an advice from the chat just a couple we're about five advice. minutes over so I want to be real respectful of your time Rick let me know if, if we're, we're no I'm actually, I'm actually okay I just, I'm sorry that I rambled so much no so we, 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 we love it because it really gives us a sense of, of um again, what it, what it was like 20 some odd years ago. So we've got John Kramer. He's got some of the best comments. Yeah. Go, he said, look, take your ring out of the safety deposit <laughs> box. Go to Etna. Etna is a, vol a live volcano on yes. Sicily, right? I've actually seen the lava flows. Yes. Go up to Etna and we'll destroy it together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, it, it, Frank it will sure, carry you. It sure feels like the world could use a little more joy, right? So, um, <laughs> so anything to help in that way. If, if You know, John, if, if that's the way to do it, if that's going to help, then I'll, I'll do it. You know, you just, you, know, <laughs> you just tell me why. Okay. What else we got? Another question. Oh, in English too. How would you assess the impact of the cinematic technology enhancement should Peter Jackson decide to start reshooting the trilogy in 2022, um, 23 years later, right? Almost. Yeah, well, I don't think you'd ever reshoot, right? But, um, but uh, look, it, it, what's interesting is that there's definitely things that, were invented then by by different companies, Weta Digital, you know, ILM, you know, by, you know, a lot of different folks. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no question that we were like early days for some of that stuff. Like, for example, um, motion capture, you know, with mm -hmm. Gollum um, mm -hmm. and Andy, you know, that's now something that is used in video games a lot, mm -hmm. right? Because it limits the number of animators you need. You still need to clean up the, you know, the data. 
And um, but, you know, it, it limits that. Now, it was early days. So for us, you know, it was a dance between, you know, motion capture and, you know, um, reference for the animators um, because Andy, you know, really, you know, embodied that performance. Mm -hmm. um, but the animators were also a part of that performance. And Fran Walsh, by the way, was very instrumental in, in overseeing, you know, the directing of that performance as well. Um, you know, so it's so, so, so anyway, motion capture, definitely if an early thing that now is just getting better and better every day, right? Every second. Um, there was an old piece of technology that we used back then um, that was even older that we used on Death Becomes Her. So in the old days when, on Death Becomes Her, when you were shooting on film and you, they were optical effects, not digital effects, if you wanted to do a very complicated effect shot like showing Goldie Hawn with a hole in her stomach. Uh -huh. You wanted to be able to see the couch behind Goldie Hawn and you wanted to move the camera. So let's say you wanted to push in on a dolly, mm -hmm. right? You needed to use this technology called motion control that had been invented by ILM. And basically that meant that the camera and the dolly was connected to a computer, right? So that when the grip pushed the dolly at a certain pace and the camera's pushing in once they were like great that's the take we like that the computer memorized that move and the grip would step away and they would replicate the computer would drive Without. the dolly so that yeah. way you could get one plate of Goldie Hawn sitting on the couch delivering yep. her line and then a second plate without Goldie Hawn and just the couch and yep. then you had a perfect match but because of technology we didn't need motion uh, control anymore. They were able to just do that. You could give mm -hmm. them those two plates and they could make it work, right? Because of digital technology. We ended up using motion control in Lord of the Rings for some of the scale work. So mm -hmm. that when, you know, scale, if you're using force perspective. Frodo to Gandalf kind of thing. Right? Yeah, Gandalf yeah. and Bilbo in the kitchen, for example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you want to move the camera forward well, Gandalf needs to always appear larger than Bilbo. And so right. you, know, you want to have that locked in. So, but that's an old technology. Would you need that anymore? Probably not. But some of these other technologies, like the early AI work done with Massive, you know, what that what they're able to do now, what we're able to do with digital characters now, you know, mm -hmm. how you're able to use them for even greater stunts. You know, we're still, you know, we're still not perfect yet with a human. Right in terms mm -hmm. of close up, right? Like really close up, you know, the mm -hmm, skin mm -hmm. and all that. We're not perfect yet, but we're getting closer and closer. So there's no question that, you know, if we had 2022 technology back then, right? There are definitely some things that would have been easier, um, you know. And uh, you know, remember, um, you know, we were also delivering on film, so you know, that's those are multiple steps for delivery you know, uh, that no longer exist when you're just right. in digital. So there's a lot of things that would have made the process maybe shorter, easier, um, definitely would have been more helpful for, um, you know, processes more helpful to Peter, you know, that would have made his life easier. You know, his hours would have been less long, <laughs> probably, sure. you know, and that goes for, for you know, um, other folks. But, you know, don't forget that he made The Hobbit not too long ago, a little more recently. And The Hobbit about twelve, kind of, maybe twelve years after the trilogy, yeah. but and, you already see some big differences. Yeah. So The Hobbit took advantage of a lot of those technologies. Yeah. But it's growing so fast, and what's really great mm -hmm. is again a lot of that tech is now also happening in video games, so that you know video games have the issue of processing in real time. It's quite right. remarkable the kind of imagery they can give you today you know, uh, playing and that's only going to get better. So all these different mediums, you know, people are starting to talk about the metaverse now, right? Oh, yeah. And, you know, what we're going to get with virtual worlds someday, um, you know, and, and, and all that, you know, is escalating, right? Technology kind of keeps growing fast, faster and faster. So um, it's, I think it's a really exciting time that we live in and um, in terms of that stuff. And I think it's great to have more and more tools, but in the end, it's still, Storytelling, world building, character. Got to come back to the core, right? Right. If, yeah. If, if that if that stuff doesn't happen, who cares how nice the shot is? Right. Who cares how great the visual effects is? Right. Who cares how beautiful that you know that environment may look? If you don't have you know story and character and world you know world building, 
the other stuff just falls flat, right? It's a, a lot of what we discussed in our rings of power analysis for sure. Yeah. Okay, right. the last one. Yeah, last one. Last one. Okay, so um, which has been the funniest experience and the funniest actor or actress? Qual è stata l'esperienza più divertente, ragazzi? Wow. I mean, well, 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 quando, quando, quando Viggo Mortensen yeah. si è rotto il piede. Do you know this? No. Yeah, ask him. Did when Viggo Mortensen broke his, his toe. broke his toe? I wasn't there for that. But uh, ah. but uh but um I, what's you know I, it definitely um I don't think that's funny. It, you know, it's a pretty that He's was pretty, so that was pretty much. Amazing. <laughs> that was pretty amazing because that was the fifth take, right? And um and he gave such an incredible performance, you know. He hung in there, especially on that take. Yeah, uh, you know, and that's the take that's in the movie. You know, the takes in the yeah. movie is him breaking the toe. But what people forget is that, like later, you know, Vigo and Orlando and and Brett, who was Gimli's double, you know, who was you know. Uh, shorter in stature and so you know he was the the perfect double for Gimli mm -hmm. with Orlando and 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 Vigo because you know Jean Rhys Davies is quite tall you know he's like six yes. one or whatever yep so those three you know when they're trying to chase the Urukai to to you know to get you know to try to get to Marion Pippin in other words the scenes that precede you know that moment they um they were like all running right mm -hmm. wounded you know You know, he, he he got two broken toes. I thought that was two. I don't know, just one. But like, you know, and Orlando had like, you know, cracked ribs and Brett had like a, a bad knee. You know, it's just, you know, um, it's just, uh, it, it's always, it just, it, you know, it just the kind of what everybody put into it, you know. Um, but yeah, look, there was a lot of laughter in the movies. There was a lot of, uh, I think there was, That was like one of the ways to get through it, right? Remember, this is 14 months of shooting. Mm. And the last chunk of shooting was six days a week. And yeah. just because someone had a day off, that didn't mean they probably had some work to do. Right. You know, it, it was a lot of long hours, a um, lot of days in a row. And, you know, one of the things that got people together was just that family atmosphere and that yeah. playful atmosphere. You know, having a food fight, you know, on, on like the, you know, That happened. There, you know, like just, yeah, just th there's a lot of fun antics between the actors, mm -hmm. but also between the crew. And, you know, everybody knew each other so well, you yeah. know, by the time the movies were done. Um, so I think without that laughter, you know, would have it would have been a bit grueling. It would have been near impossible to make. And sure. I think Peter was really good about creating environments where people could have fun. You know, he was not a director that was screaming at people and yelling and he, yeah. he didn't lead by fear, right? Right. Which is great. He Quindi was, ragazzi, he led by a positive fun environment. Mm. Quello il concetto che viene fuori da, dalle parole di Rick e purtroppo non c'era quando si è rotto il dito Vigo, questo lo abbiamo capito. Però il concetto che viene fuori è ancora quello, e cioè che la, una delle più migliori capacità uh, di Peter Jackson è stata quella di creare il giusto ambiente, un ambiente positivo in cui tutti potevano divertirsi e in cui tutti potevano lavorare in armonia e addirittura appena acciaccate, con, con le coste rotte da quello che ho capito, Orlando, Orlando Bloom, Vigo col piede, eccetera, eccetera. Quindi, nonostante tutto, l'ambiente era super positivo e questo ha permesso a tutti di lavorare per bene e di raggiungere un grande risultato quindi uno dei meriti più grandi che va Peter Jackson vedete ora abbiamo avuto un punto di vista da tecnico da tecnico dietro le quinte che però ha collaborato ha lavorato in maniera costante con Peter Jackson e quindi ha capito quali, quali erano le intenzioni di Peter Jackson e soprattutto il suo modo di lavorare molto più magari degli attori che hanno, sono stati a contatto di Peter Jackson per brevi momenti quindi vedete, questo è un altro punto di vista che è estremamente interessante e che ci dà, eh, apre un altro, eh, diciamo, un altro occhio su quello che è stato il lavoro di Peter Jackson. Ma okay. well, Peter, Peter, Peter had a funny response there when those guys were running, you know, which was when they were, you know, they were kind of suffering a little bit, you know, I just got a real kick out of it because, you know, he, he, he said something to the effect of, this is not an exact quote, but something to the effect of, um, Pain is temporary, film is forever. <laughs> so just, good. It's true, but it's also like a funny thing. It's like it's, it's you know, 
<laughs> it's so true. It That's a great quote. Chuckle, you know? Like it That's was great. It was yeah. a great response. You know, like, yeah. Rick, it's been um, an extraordinary evening for me. I, I love to hear um, this sort of technical side of things. I love to feel what it was like on set and, and just have that really come to life for us, the people who just kind of get to see the film. Um, and so it, it just becomes more and more real for me, um, especially with your interview and your time here with us tonight. So thank you, thank you so thank much you. for no sharing your experience. Your time Most here. interesting and fascinating interview. Ever. I think so. It's it, yeah. it was absolutely incredible. Yeah, I, I personally, people liked it. I love your acting work. Um, acting. Personally, <laughs> no. Uh, I, no I think the it's the way the, the weird stuff is that I can understand him, but not you. <laughs> it's it's really because she's from Virginia. I think in Virginia they, they have a, a really weird accent. Maybe I need to storyboard more. <laughs> Maybe that's my method of communication that needs to happen. Um, Rick, so thank you, thank you so much again. Lord, you are you. welcome Lord, to come Lord. visit us in Italy anytime. We'd love to have you. We'll Definitely. take you around. I'm sure there's a, a pizza. Lot of are you kidding? I will I, cook you carbonara. I, I will cook you. I'm a great. Don't listen to him. I'm great. I think I'll need to lose 20 pounds before I show up so I can do that. <laughs> We'd love to have you. But again, thank you so much for your time. It's been special for us and the audience. No worries. Thank you, Eric. Everybody on this stream. All right. Take care of yourself. Thank Stay you. Soon. Thank you. Right. Take Bye. care. Bye. Va bene ragazzi, allora, io innanzitutto ringrazio ancora Rick Porras. Oh è stato gosh. gentilissimo, è stata credo la, la, la live più divertente yeah. e dal punto di vista tecnico quella più interessante perché come vi dicevo Rick ci ha dato un punto di vista che in realtà è diverso è mm. stato abbastanza diverso da quello del, che ci avevano dato gli attori eh, come appunto Rosy Cotton e lo stesso il nostro eh, Lee Hartley con la prima live che abbiamo fatto oh, abbiamo oh, la prima oh, intervista oh, ma che ehm, proprio dandoci questo punto di vista diverso lui ci ha permesso di capire ulteriori aneddoti su quello che è stato il lavoro di Peter Jackson cioè è stato fantastico quando ci ha descritto appunto la, come Peter Jackson lavorava cioè Peter Jackson la cosa, la sua, il suo obiettivo principale era quello di creare la giusta atmosfera di creare l'atmosfera la, la, in cui tutti potevano lavorare in maniera tranquilla ehm, nel giusto mood e, e potevano anche divertirsi nonostante le, i, i gli inconvenienti che potevano accadere come ad esempio le ossa rotte <ride> ci sono, ovviamente ci sono stati molti attori che si sono rotti le ossa e l'ha detto, detto lo stesso Rick e, allora ragazzuoli io voglio, sì infatti è stata una cosa che ho notato, è, è, è veramente persona gradevolissima, molto alla mano mm. eh, parla un inglese che cioè ragazzi per capirlo io credo di aver capito il 90% di quello che ha detto in certi passaggi mi sono perso un attimo perché venivo a leggere i vostri commenti <ride> e stavo attento ad altre cose, però se l'ho capito quasi totalmente io, credo che chi mastica l'inglese già un minimo, secondo me non, av non avrà avuto problemi o comunque non avrà problemi a riascoltare la live e capire ancora meglio quello che diceva. Comunque, io non posso far altro che ringraziare Reca, oltre a Adriano che era in off live e mi dava qualche dritta. Ringrazio ovviamente Reca per... Eh, per il lavoraccio che ha fatto grazie Recal eh, avresti dovuto vederla da questa parte in che senso? perché Recal sei stato un, pre, un, 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 un gioiellino perché eh, io cercavo ovviamente di dare i concetti generali però per chi poi sarà interessato a proprio rileggere, a riascoltare l'intervista eh, leggendo, capendo ogni parola di quello che ha detto il, il nostro ospite il lavoro di Recal nei commenti è stato fantastico. Quindi chi rivedrà questa live, mi raccomando, aprite la sezione commenti perché Recal ha fatto un lavorone incredibile. E cercheremo di coinvolgere Recal, magari se vorrà, anche nelle prossime volte. Quindi Recal, magari ci teniamo un attimo in contatto e se vorrai eh, il, tuo, il tuo aiuto sarà più che prezioso nelle prossime volte. Perché io, per esempio, quando abbiamo intervistato Rosy Cotton e anche Lee Hart, io non ci ho capito veramente poco, lì è 40-50% di quello che avevano detto perché purtroppo il neozelandese a quanto pare non lo riesco a capire l'accento di, quel, di, di, di quelle zone lì invece questo accento l'ho capito perfettamente ripeto, il 90% ho capito quello che ha detto quindi accento californiano e non capisco mia moglie cioè io capisco quello che ho capito lui e non capisco mia moglie questa è una cosa molto, molto particolare comunque, vi leggo un po' in chat poi ci salutiamo, che spettacolo ho scritto in chat che, eh, perché mi sono goduto appieno questa stupenda intervista grazie Savero, mi fa piacere ragazzi mi fa veramente piacere e che l'abbiate apprezzata, Kelly sta facendo un lavorone e proprio oggi <coughs> mi ha dato la notizia che potremmo avere, dovrebbe essere confermata you wow. have to confirm ok, Let me see. 
c'è un nano in attesa di essere confermato <ride> ora fate il totona il totona non è gimli no, non esagerà non è gimli è un nano è un nano che è in attesa di essere confermato per un'intervista, va bene? Quindi un nano importante, solo questo vi dico. Quindi è in attesa di conferma. Staremo a vedere, Staremo a... dovrebbe arrivare proprio la settimana prossima, tra l'altro. Dovrebbe arrivare la settimana prossima, vedremo, vedremo. Grazie Riccardo, chi se l'è persa mi si mangerà le mani. Chi se l'è persa se la riguarda tranquillamente. No, non vi diciamo chi è il nano, <coughs> è uno dei nani. <ride> uno dei nani. Sì, potrebbero esserci alcuni tecnici e stuntmen dei Rings of Power, perché gli attori sono impegnati, lo sapete, stanno girando la seconda stagione, potremmo intervistare. Lì io penso che farò scena muta. <ride> penso che me ne starò zitto in un angolino e farò parlare che è lì. Non devono recordare questo prima e poi... Then... Release the recording, not do a live. Probabilmente si sì, faremo, registreremo la live e mh, ve la metteremo perché dovremo tagliare molte mie bestemmie. E probabilmente no. Fate scherzi, eh, <ride> li lascerei perdere? No, in realtà no, Morgoth, perché è comunque interessante. Perché ragazzi, il lavoro, comunque, chi ci ha lavorato ha fatto un lavoro importante. Quindi non è che se il risultato finale è quello che è quello che abbiamo visto, chi ci ha lavorato, tutti quelli che ci hanno lavorato hanno lavorato di merda, no, non è così quindi sarebbe interessante gli stessi attori, ci sono alcuni attori, lo stesso attore di, eh, di Arondir io l'ho apprezzato tanto, a me è piaciuto come ha interpretato la, il suo ruolo poi il risultato finale della serie è quello che è però a me è piaciuto Arondir, l'attore di Arondir è stato bravo per quanto mi riguarda, quindi sarebbe bello poterlo intervistare puoi chiedere a Kelly se è mai stata a Chicago e cosa ne pensa della città, ve lo dico io no. non le piace io le avevo proposto di trasferirci a Chicago. Lei mi ha detto, a parte che mi ha detto che nelle, ho, ho constatato... Uh, quello mi piace. Que per più che altro le, le case in periferia costano molto. Tipo una casa, una villetta tranquilla con Provo quattro vento, stanze eh, costa 4.000 dollari al mese come affitto. Che 4.000 dollari al mese, raga, è un, no. è un qualcosa di spropositato. E, e poi mi ha, mi ha detto che la periferia eh, subito fuori Chicago è, è mal, estremamente malfamata quindi non, eh, questa è stata la sua quando ne abbiamo parlato eh, questa è stata la sua opinione bello di poi, visitare Ma, abitare? no ah, di visitare visitare non, non l'ha mai nemmeno visitata però da quello che ho capito è, ha questa fama Chicago tra gli americani e più che altro i costi sono alti ma lei mi ha spiegato che un po' tutto il nord degli Stati Uniti i costi sono altissimi i costi della vita e i costi delle case purtroppo questa è una dannazione perché io odio il caldo quindi però vabbè staremo, staremo a vedere dai staremo a vedere e secondo me i tecnici di Rings of Power potrebbero riservare delle chicche sì 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 sono d'accordo con te Andre per questo secondo me potrebbe essere molto interessante poter intervistare uno di loro Beh, vedremo vedremo uh, Kelly ci sta lavorando considerate che eh, man mano che il clamore della serie passa diciamo i vari le, i vari addetti ai lavori si renderanno sempre più disponibili perché ovviamente saranno meno indaffrati da interviste da compiti particolari da impegni gli stessi attori una volta che magari avranno finito di girare la seconda stagione ci saremo fra la seconda, la seconda stagione e la terza magari qualcuno di loro potrà dedicare a qualche intervista anche sul web su youtube su un canale youtube italiano quindi eh, date il tempo date tempo a rings of power arriveremo magari si potrà arrivare tranquillamente anche a quello e poi Kelly è peggio di Chicago o Detroit? Minchia. I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I think Detroit. Detroit, Detroit è peggio. Penso. Detroit è peggio. Raga, ma, allora, ma che deve capire che, che viene da, dalla Virginia? Pennsylvania. No, Pennsylvania. No, Virginia. No, Pennsylvania. Virginia. <ride> Mississippi. <ride> Alabama. Sweet home, Alabama. Sei d'accordo con, le, 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 con le, le tradizioni dell'Alabama? Lei ho chiesto: sei in Alabama? È vero che tra, si sposano tra fratelli, tra cugini? Lei ha detto di sì. You say yes. I did not. Eh. Eh, è vero, <ride> raga, sta cosa. Io pensavo That's fosse una leggenda. Ah, Kelly, why everyone say made in Ohio? Ragazzi, know. allora, l'avete visto il gioco che stanno facendo su TikTok? Tutti quanti dicono made in Ohio, made in Ohio, this so. is from Ohio, Kalel from Ohio. Perché tutti quanti from Ohio? Non What so. is this from no, Ohio? Non lo so, c'è un meme. È un meme. Non lo so. Un meme. <ride> this is a meme. A meme. A meme. meme. <ride> from Ohio. 
a memes o aio o aios meme non si sa perché raga non si è capito che cazzo sta succedendo su tiktok ma tutti parlano dell'Ohio che lei mi ha detto che in Ohio sono tutti sfigati praticamente quindi è uno stato molto goofy è uno stato molto sfigato forse per quello che lo stanno, lo stanno prendendo un po' per il culo non so perché c'è, c'è qualcuno che ti chiede Kelly hai mai giocato a Los Angeles Noir che cos'è Los Angeles Noir? Uh, Los Angeles Noir? Noir? I don't know che, che roba è Mastro? So. I've been to LA I've been to LA it's really cool I don't mm. know what Los Angeles Noir is e... Sì, è vero, non c'è nulla di male in teoria, salvo problemi di malattia genetica. È quello il problema, Marco. <ride> è quello il problema. In realtà dovrebbe essere illegale. Cioè, fra parenti è illegale, raga. Per, proprio per questo motivo qui, perché ehm, i matrimoni, le, le unioni tra parenti aumentano a dismisura il rischio, rischio di eh, malattie genetiche. Perché? Perché nella stessa famiglia è molto più probabile che ci siano degli alleli, quindi dei geni mutati, appartenenti che eh, responsabili di determinate malattie, e come ben sappiamo, se tu quell'allele, se tu quegli alleli, noi abbiamo due alleli per i vari geni, se noi abbiamo un allele mutato di una malattia in omozigosi, tu quella malattia è molto probabile, che è molto più presente, comunque è quasi sicuro che tu abbia quella malattia. Invece alcune malattie in eterozigosi, cioè se tu hai una sol- un solo allele di quel gene mutato, lì è meno probabile che tu possa avere quella malattia, o comunque anche un problema di... Ehm, eh, di penetrazione della malattia cioè quanto effettivamente viene fuori quella malattia in base a, al, tuo, al tuo genotipo quindi si moltiplica tantissimo la possibilità di avere delle, delle malattie genetiche abbastanza gravi se si uni, ci si unisce all'interno della famiglia perché si hanno gli stessi geni quindi c'è più probabilità di avere due copie dello stesso gene mutato per renderla molto molto semplice ci dice eh, Mastro che è un gioco ambientato negli anni 40 di tipo poliziesco. Ok, no, non lo mm. conosci. No, ma non è, una, non è una player, ragazzi. Non gioca un cacchio lei. Sa, sa su Instagram. Guarda Instagram. Lei. Scorre il ditino su Instagram. E <ride> Links of Power è il lot di Ohio. <ride> esatto. <ride> Esattamente. Quando l'intervista con Ian McKellen? Eh. Eh. Raga, allora, a parte che alcuni di loro richiedono un budget, <ride> cioè richiedono proprio un cachet, e non è nemmeno, ovviamente, non è nemmeno un cachet così contenuto. Give me time. Give me sì, time. sì, è che... Ragazzi, okay. datele, datele tempo. Cioè, già abbiamo avuto Rosy Cotton, eh, abbiamo un nano in attesa, insomma, ci abbiamo già un po' di chicche, non vi preoccupate, altre cose in futuro. Poi vi ripeto, eh, tutte queste live che noi stiamo facendo... Per quanto per alcuni di voi, eh vabbè, Rick Paul, chi è Rick, Rick Paul ci ha dato alcune delle informazioni più interessanti che abbiamo avuto fino ad ora, ragazzi. Questo che vi dicevo, quello che vi dicevo proprio quando abbiamo iniziato questo format, eh, cambiare il punto di vista, magari anche di persone che hanno lavorato sulla, sulla, sulla trilogia, ma non sono così famose, per, quindi non hanno questo gran richiamo per il loro nome, ma magari ci hanno lavorato in maniera importante, come appunto Rick Paul, e se possono darci delle chicche molto interessanti, sia per gli addetti ai lavori, ma anche per gli appassionati. E tutte queste live che noi stiamo facendo serviranno come curriculum, come curriculum per il canale, in modo tale che Kelly potrà utilizzare queste live per mostrare agli agenti e agli attori come verrà condotta la live e se potrà essere o meno apprezzata e quindi se quella, quell'attore, quell'ospite eh, potrà o meno apprezzare il nostro modo di gestire queste live. Quindi ci state, infatti ci state comunque aiutando tantissimo perché siete sempre molto gentili ed educati, e quindi grazie anche per questo. E uh, poi abbiamo avuto solo mezza rosicotto, niente comparsa a presa di sempre. Purtroppo no, ragazzi, purtroppo quella, quella ci avevo sperato un po' io, però niente. sarà per la prossima volta anche con, uh, con Sembise Genji. Mm-hmm. Sembise Genji. This is the story of the baker, the meanest cut of the Chicago town. What is that? I don't know. Raga, ma che state a dire? Perché mettete in soggezione che... <ride> che dite cose che Kelly non conosce? I think all American things I must know, and I'm really not that. E lì c'è avuto, eh, raga, eh, vabbè, che vedeva Tom Cruise. <ride> Parte fatto, ma ti, ti sembra, Rick Porra somiglia molto a Ben Affleck. A little. Yeah, really similar to Ben Affleck. It's Ragazzi, è molto simile. Yeah, and, uh, no, questa parte yeah, qua. Yeah, yeah. Somiglia un po' a, a Ben Affleck, Rick, Paul, Rick Porra. Eh. Recisione di avermi visto a Luca, grande Ale, grande. Luca? Chi è Luca? Oddio, ricomincia. Grande Alessandro, grande. Ah, ho, ho incontrato molti di voi, infatti mi ha fatto piacere potervi salutare. E... Si, si riorganizzerà, ragazzi, non vi preoccupate. È una canzone, Frank. Okay, non la conosco. Non la conosce manco Kelly, a quanto pare. Vabbè, ragazzi, allora, direi che possiamo andare in chiusura. Um, è stata un'ottima, bellissima serata, quindi ringrazio tutti, ringrazio 
la signora qui a fianco, che adesso se ne andrà a dormire, che oggi stava tutta stressata, eh, io devo finire di lavorare, lei va a dormire e io lavoro. E questa, e questa, e questa, e questa. E noi, allora, ci, ho, anche oggi avevo detto che ci, avrei cercato di streamare oggi pomeriggio, non ci sono riuscito. Probabilmente ci riuscirò domani. Quindi domani pomeriggio ci vediamo su Twitch. E domani usciranno tra due video. Un video qui, bellissimo il video, il risultato che è venuto, ragazzi, una collaborazione con Riccardo Ricobello, mi raccomando, mi raccomando, non mancate domani, ore 16, ore, anzi, ore 18 qui su YouTube per il prossimo video. Mentre domani mattina uscirà il mio mio video sul, sul canale dove parlo di cinema quindi chi vuole Cine Frank venite a trovarmi anche lì, trovate il canale sulla home page di questo canale per chi è appassionato di cinema e eh, non solo e, e domani pomeriggio cerco di fare anche la live su Twitch ci provo, ci provo, ogni pomeriggio lo sto dicendo però purtroppo sto avendo un bel po' di cose da fare hai avuto di vedere il... no, non l'ho avuto di vedere ancora Marco, no, ancora no, ancora no sto veramente, sto bazzicando pochissimo gli ultimi tempi YouTube perché sto con mille cose da fare raga sto con un milione di cose da fare quindi perché ovviamente sto adesso che mi sono preso una ci siamo finalmente levati di torno alla serie eh, ho dovuto riprendere tutti i progetti e tutti i vari, vari impegni che io ho dovuto fermare prima della serie e si sono accumulate tante di quelle cose da fare che io devo recuperare un mese e mezzo di lavoro perché appunto l'ho ignorato per tutto il tempo della serie e questo è stato il risultato del dedicarmi totalmente alla serie che adesso ho il dieci volte il lavoro che avevo prima voi direte, bene, Frank, lavori? Eh, ho capito, però dovrei avere anche più tempo per lavorare di più. Questo è il problema, e purtroppo io questo tempo non ce l'ho. E... Va bene, allora. Quindi ci vediamo, forse domani su Twitch, comunque domani escono i due video, e poi, ragazzi, giovedì, ve lo dico a voi che siete arrivati fino adesso in live, giovedì sera, io e Paolo, in live, faremo la classifica in tier list dei personaggi più potenti dell'universo di Tolkien. Questa sarà la serata di giovedì, quindi si prospetta una live di 5 ore, anche perché, ah, dobbiamo salutare Paolo, perché Paolo il 20 parte va in Israele, quindi mi raccomando, siate numerosi giovedì sera per questa live in cui salutiamo Paolo e ci divertiamo a, de a decidere quali sono i personaggi più potenti dell'universo tolkieniano, quindi sarà una live, non so ancora se della, della, della trilogia, solo la trilogia, cioè del, del Signore Ianelli, eh, libro o film, o dell'universo um, uh, della, de, dell tolkieniano in generale questo non lo so, lo vedremo comunque, mi raccomando dai Frank, molla tutto e date a YouTube ma una parte di questi progetti sono proprio su YouTube ragazzi, cioè ormai il 50% di quello che faccio lo dedico a YouTube l'altro 50% ad altre cose Però ormai il mio 50% il 50% del mio tempo lo dedico totalmente a YouTube tra i vari progetti che sto portando avanti c'è anche un altro progetto con un canale che non vi posso nominare, in cui sono dietro le quinte che è un canale abbastanza importante eh, ha più iscritti di questo, di questo canale Valinor, almeno al momento, quindi direi che anche, sto lavorando anche su quel progetto lì, quindi è, è lì è, è proprio una situazione lavorativa eh, ma ragazzi, io sto su YouTube da dieci anni l'ho detto tante, tante volte, cento volte quindi ormai YouTube fa parte della mia vita e va bene Kelly, a Ninna, dormire? Sì. Ragazzi, quindi a domani e poi a giovedì la persona più potente è Kelly vestita da Galadria Perfetto. Ha fatto, ragazzi, ha fatto un figurone a, a, a Luca a Luca a Luca. A Luca, a Luca ciao ragazzi, ciao, un bacione e a domani, ciao 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 ragazzi buonanotte, notte, notte, notte